I don't mean to be patronizing, but I mean to be a little bit patronizing. As a founder, your job is not to run out of money. If you got $8 million instead of $2 million, it's not to spend it all. Why are they spending it all? The great founders are going big. Why can't they use a spreadsheet and do the math and say, I got a gift from heaven. Why can't the best founders take advantage of this? I am so excited for this. This is going to be such a fun discussion today. Now, we're going to dive right in because I got teed up by a comment from Rick first, who said that uh, we need a Jerry Maguire moment in venture. I love Jerry Maguire, but I was intrigued. What did you mean by this, Rick? So Jerry Maguire is one of my all-time favorite movies. Like, Part of me really wishes I was a sport agent. Um, yeah, And for those who don't know what this movie is about jerry is this kind of soulless sports agent working in this big agency that has come and he has kind of a come to jesus moment but he realizes that they're working with too many clients they're trying to scale too much you know that they've lost that kind of like hands-on connection with their clients and that they need to go like back to the core business focus on the clients over making money he writes this big man manifesto catch on the rise style uh and then he ends up getting fired for it but all ends well that ends well you know he ends up developing a close relationship helps his client through a bunch of these struggles and you know hilarity ensues all along the way and yeah in many ways i think this is what venture used to look like it was a really hands-on connection between a board member and event and the founder uh and then you guys talked a little bit on your last round table about this factory model i think that's really torn that all, all out of whack where it's become about how much we can be an asset management business how much we can scale the capital that we have and that's really taking vcs away from the founders um and really focus on some things that i think are some really unhealthy behaviors but make no mistake the asset management business is a better business than the venture business you know fees are guaranteed carry isn't for me at least early in my career like we had these i had two big nine-figure exits that were founders that didn't take a lot of paid in capital and the relationships that i had with those folks was really really intimate and you know one of those founders made close to 100 million dollars on it. it changed his life it changed you know uh his family's life and uh as i went back to some other venture capital firms like you need another zero on that for that to matter like when are any of these deals that you do are gonna are they ever gonna move the needle and certainly move the needle for that founder and that was kind of like my jerry moment of realizing there's an opportunity to go back to basics do less companies we have 15 companies yeah. in our first one you said unicorn investing is mostly dead for bigger funds and experienced VCs. No one is looking for a billion dollar outcome anymore. What did you mean by this, Jason? Well, I'll tell you, when I we were chatting before about things I learned when I started investing, I didn't get. But when I started investing, I remember one of my LPs, limited partners, came back. And this is probably nine years ago from Founders Fund LP meeting, right? And this is a decade ago. And they came back and they told their LPs who were stunned that they're aiming for at least $100 billion outcome per fund. Now, this isn't today when you can look, at least there's a few of those above that line, right? The, the service now is in the Salesforce and B2B. This people's jaws drop, but Peter Thiel obviously was the angel in seed in Facebook. So they'd had multiple $100 billion outcomes and they drew a line and they said, this is how the internet's growing. <laughs> this is how many people are using the internet. Over the next 10 years, we should be able to have at least $100 billion outcome per fund. That's what... Uh, that's what these these kids working for me are going to go do. And, um, you know, that is still a, a slightly audacious goal in venture. But I think everyone has adopted one lovable. You got to have these $10 billion outcomes. And I do think everyone that's been doing venture for a while that is elite has at least one $10 billion outcome. That's what fuels these big funds, right? That and fees, as Rick alluded to, right? And other things. But one $10 billion outcome per GP per fund can uh, fuel fuel the tank for a long time. That That's what the goal is. And the problem is that the 10% of a billion dollar outcome is 100 million in a billion dollar fund. You're not even, you're, you know, you're not, you're 10%. You're, you're barely, you're an asterisk, like we talked about. You're an asterisk outcome. You don't even count. But I think this right. is one of the reasons why, like, structurally, like, you know, bigger funds at early stage are problematic. At a seed stage, it's extremely, extremely difficult to say, okay, here's going to be a deck core versus, you know, a billion dollar. Like, yes, there are certain TAM constraints on some of these companies, but I think you talked about in one of the last round tables, Jason, about talk desk that you were like, oh, this is like, you know, on company, it's a five nine, this is maybe $150 million outcome and it's a $10 billion company. So I think like, you know, the reality is, yeah, if your founder's fun or if you're seeing these companies that have the chance to be a snowflake or something else like that, I mean, the reality is what there's 20 
companies in cloud that are worth more than $10 billion. There's a lot of companies that are worth a billion to 10 billion. If you're a later stage investor, being able to back up the truck on one of those is completely different than if you have to pick those at the seed or series A stage. Yeah, uh, I think that's a much more difficult situation to be in. And you know, generally speaking, I think like that's the reason why I focus on getting into great companies. And with hopefully they become $10 billion companies. But if you need them to because your math doesn't work, that seems really, really, really problematic to me. Speaking of the maths working, I do just have to ask, when you look at the amount of $2 billion companies, sorry, $2 billion funds plus that we have today, Jason, we did the math last time on what it takes to five or six X, a $500 million fund. The maths to make a $2 billion plus fund work is simply eye-watering. I guess my question is, what, what happens to these mammoth funds where there's now 10 plus of them? Do they reduce? Do they go away? Do they maintain and find new LPs? What happens to the era of Megafund? I think they're going to reflate at the end of next year. I think there will be a resurgence of Megafunds in late 2024 and 2025. I think we're all looking backwards. And we talked a little bit before about the flood of IPOs and the return of liquidity that's going to happen. The pendulum has swung the other way, right? That we, we On 20VC, there's so many stories of how hard it is to raise a fund and how LPs are, are cutting back. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. It can't last, right? You're either in this asset class or you're not. So I know it may seem contrarian, but I don't think so. I think is, you know, 2021 was a great year for LPs, right? 2022 for some LPs actually was still great because of the time lag, right? You could actually have a great year as an LP in 2022 if you're finally getting your post lockup distributions. A lot of folks had a good 2022. Some had a terrible, but it bled in. But when times are good money will reflood into this. So I think we just have to be careful about drawing short-term conclusions when I actually see so many things getting slightly better, like slightly better. And it's really hard to see that curve, that logarithmic or parabolic distribution, but we want to count them out, but I think we should count them in. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with you that these funds are going to keep on getting bigger. I think one thing that we could see is the maturation of this truly going from like venture capital to an asset management business, which if you look at the way that the Bridgewaters or Carlisle's or those like, yeah, they had core kind of, you know, funds and then they splintered off into strategies. And I think firms like, you know, Andreessen and Squay have already started doing that with their sub strategies and so forth and having dedicated teams around those that I think that'll start driving a little bit more rational math around like, how do we go and return, you know, a fund that fits that strategy um, as they start you know, doing that across their teams. And I think we're going to see more of that as the venture business looks more like an asset management business for those type of firms. Just just because like, yeah, there's not that many $100 billion outcomes. And if you're going to have one single strategy with a $5 billion fund, you know, you really need to be in those $100 billion outcomes. And, and that'll make that an incredibly competitive process. But I think the splintering off of professionalization of turning into asset management is really going to happen in venture in the next couple of years. Can I just ask a, answer a question you asked before? I'd love to get your thoughts too, right? I know you asked this version of this question a lot about multi-stage funds coming in early, displacing seed funds instead of doing a two on 10, doing a 10 on 40 or whatever the math is. I actually don't think it's new. At least it's not new for second time founders, right? It's not new. Here's my thought back. So what? I mean, here's the, here's the Crimea River part. Founders, your job is not to run out of money. The problem is that they run out of money. And all this, the, the seed guys will say the problem with five on 25 is you can't raise the next round. You're, you're stuck. You're, you, have a, you have a hostage. You know, huge fund won't write you a second check. It's all true. It's all true if your seed's at 50, it's really hard to raise the next round at 20. And it's all true that if mega fund puts the money in, they, they see you as an option. But so what? Your job as a founder, if you got 8 million instead of 2 million, is not to spend it all. Why are they spending it all? I don't mean to be patronizing, but I mean to be a little bit patronizing. As a founder, your job is not to run out of money. And where did this get lost in the, in the seed dialogue? Like, it, it, where did it get lost? So, so I think if you can raise more money and operate with the mindset of having 20% of the money that you raised and putting the other 80% in a separate account and not spending that money, amazing. Yeah. You should absolutely do that and you should take the five on 25. But I've never seen anyone do that. But ever. why? Why don't the great founders do that? I understand why the mediocre founders don't do it. I understand why they get by a Tesla and rent a beach house with the money. The great founders are going big. Why can't they use a spreadsheet and do the math and say, I got a gift from heaven. Uh, I got four years of runway and I'm not going to screw it up. Why, why, do I, why can't the best founders take advantage of this? 
because you can hire you can hire more engineers you can expand product faster you can expand sales team faster you can test multiple different marketing strategies at once in multiple different regions at yeah, once but why run out of money because you're doing all of those things you are you are you are choosing <laughs> you can't speed. do the math you can't figure out your zero cash date you can't build the spreadsheet you can't do a last four months analysis why 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 can't you do these things but i think this is all because like you know the assumption on, on capital being so abundant and the reality is like a focus on growth rather than a focus on return on equity and i think a big part of this is the investor steering in the wrong direction and saying that money is going to be there they're looking at a bunch of their peers and seeing the folks do the same thing i mean the amount of stupid things that you know us as vcs and founders have done over the course of the last four or five years is ludicrous so anyone who grew up you know 10 years ago and had to go through hard times i think they do appreciate that dollar anyone who didn't have money before is looking at that and yeah they're managing their spreadsheets like very meticulously but you know we all got a little high at the party and the reality is like you know People are paying a lot for that right now. I know it's definitely- no, we, we how, did. Man, I, we did. And I blame the VCs at least as much as the founders, right? I, I stipulated 51%, 49 But the founders, it's your life. I don't get why they drive the car off the cliff. Hooray, you raised uh, at these inflated valuations. And yes, you overspent for a while. The fact that your business was declining 18 months ago, you should have seen it. You should have adjusted. You should have done something or at least not run out of money, at least not run out of money. OK, this is like you can go back to the dawns of venture capital. Rule one in 1784 was don't run out of money. It's John Doerr's rule. What excuse is there? Right. I don't I don't get why there's an excuse for running out of money. I mean, Jason, I'd be interested to get your take. Like, Did you ever have to do a riff at any of your companies? Like, no, I um, took no well. salary for 18 months. OK, I invested my own limited money from my first startup in my second. OK, I did a lot of crap. I had no I went from a modest salary to none for 18 months. Um, I did a whole bunch of things. Uh, we I stayed more efficient than I should have. But we didn't run out of money. If I if I paid myself 250 grand and hired everyone and did every campaign. No, I hunkered down. I focused on viral acquisition, which cost zero. And I paid myself nothing so I could hire a person and a half to replace me. That's what you do. And how many risks have you been a part of as an investor? Listen, I know this may be triggering. I wrote this post years ago on Saster. If you're a great SASEO, you should never have a riff. It's called recurring revenue. You should have the ability to, now I get it in B to C or D to C or X and Y and Z to C. I don't think good SAS CEO should, ever, I think it's an utter failing to ever have a riff um, unless it's a quiet talent reorg, right? That's different. A 5% riff to work out the bottom 5% and replace them with Top performers is one thing, but no, you should never have a riff. I never had one as a founder. And I think it's a, I think every CEO should be embarrassed in, in B2B if they do. The point that I'm trying to get at here is like yeah. your N of, of companies that you have if a founder, very, very small. And that riff feels deeply, deeply, deeply personal. Like yeah. the N of companies that you have as investor, I mean, the reality is, We've had to go through riffs. Like, you know, one of the things that we said over the last like 12 months is like everyone's either riffing or racing. The reality is, I think when you've seen how productive a riff can be, you know, uh, and right sizing company, especially over the course, you know, you just pick up more data points as an investor that, it, yes, it feels a little less personal. Those aren't people that you're working with on a day to day basis. But I think this is the reason why, like, there needs to be more like, cut the shit between, you know, investors and founders, which we really moved away from that over the course of the last five, 10 years, because like, just like you were talking about, like, there's a lot of incentive to sell, uh, sell a founder, a lot of incentive to be all about the NPS score. And everyone's trying to, you know, raise funds every 12 months. So they need, you know, those founder references when, I don't know, the the best relationships I have with my founders, like, you know, you can go to bat, you can fight uh, and, you know, get back to the table the next day because there's trust there. But that really moved away where it became a lot of kind of patty cake and, you know, how can we, you know, you never vote against the founder and you never kind of push back on the founder. And I, I do think like, hopefully like this creates a more productive plateau where, you know, there can actually be friction between an investor and a founder to, uh, to arrive to the right point, because I do agree with what you're saying. Those risks shouldn't happen if your company is working, but the reality is there's no pushback and people kind of get lost when they're on the highway, like speeding up and they don't see all all the risks that are around them. And that's an issue. And that's should be your job as an investor is to help leverage the fact that you have a larger end of companies than a founder does to say, hey, like you're doing something that is really concerning based on the other best practices. And people haven't done that for the last couple of years. I've seen in my own companies with other board members being like asleep at the wheel, not wanting to push back against founders and founders need it too. Like we that's we're all trying to make money together. 
Jason, do you even feel you can though? We've discussed it before. You just get put in the annoying investor or shithead box. It's a nice idea, Rick, and I like the idea of productive pushback, but I just find that I'm resented for it. I think Jason agrees with me. And so it's like, is it an idealistic state to wish that we go back for that? And do you not need a uniform consensus among investors? Because if half say, yes, we're going to push back and half say, no, we're going to give you our money completely willingly and never say anything because we just want good MPS. Well, I'll just choose the good MPS. I'd love to be the first or second largest investor in a startup, but there's one I really love. I'm the third largest. Um, I'm not on the board. I'm not even an observer. Um, I'm the largest below that level, right? But I, but I, but I am reasonably close to the founders for a very long time. And I caught up with the, the largest investor and I love everything about this company, but the burn rate remains very high. It remains 2021 high. And I said, just wondering, like, what do you guys chat? I don't go to the board meetings. What are you guys chatting about? Or like, it hasn't come up. What do you mean it's coming? It's like, I just don't know how to address it. I don't want to, I don't want to impact the relationship. I'm like, oh, I got to do it again. I'm like, okay, look at, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm the number three investor, but put the zoom together. And I brought it up, but, but, but when I'm the number three, my job is to just help. Right. So I have, I brought it up with the founder who is an A plus a 10, but burning like it's 2021, the top line justifies it. Right. But the bottom line, but the reality of today's world doesn't justify it. And it's been a year and no one wants to, to talk about the issues, right? I think we're still seeing these 2021, 2022 reverberations happen. In the end, people will have wished that conversation happened six to eight months ago. But every, the, the tenor's changed. Everything's changed. But I think this is where it becomes really important about like who's around the table and what hats are they wearing? Like, you know, you're the number three investor there and you're like, okay, I'm wearing the helper hat. But it's yeah. clear that like you kind of need to be in the case of that company, the, the person who's stepping up and like, providing some pushback at least for me like as a guy who grew up in new jersey like you know i'm just a very blunt direct person in general so you know going into those meetings and be like okay i'm gonna be the one that says the tough things in this one and here's one where i can play a little bit more a helper role and so forth but you know we all got to know what hats we're wearing and, and you know i think if those conversations are up front and you have them with founders, like they can be really, really productive. Like I'm going to give you the no bullshit response. Like, um, yep. and then they got to opt into that. Like you can't spring that on them, but you know, if that's what they want, which like, I do think there's a lot of really great board members who, you know, founders, they want a personal trainer. They don't, you know, they want someone who's going to make them better. And yeah, you know, I think there's folks like Roger Ehrenberg are a great personal trainer. So you have a cap table. The cap table can only end up to hundred percent. You sell slots, right? So let's imagine you've sold half your company in two and a half rounds. Does that mean the VCs get 50% say in how you run the company? Does it mean they have no say because the cap table they don't run the company. They're not working 365 days, 70 hours a week, thinking about it on run, a 20 mile run, thinking about it in the shower, sweating it. They're dialing in for Portofino or wherever. So what does the ratio of the cap table have to control, right? And at a board meeting, it seems very one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um, but what should it be in the new world? I don't know. I think that's what we're struggling with. And Rick, your point of going back to the old days is very compelling for folks that have been around, right? But part of me wonders, is that not, is it too late? Like, is that relationship to the cap table, to responsibility been disconnected? And I think that's how founders think about it. Founders don't think, hey, I sold 40% of my company. That means they have a 40% say. I think a lot of founders think that means they have a nuns percent say, a 0% say. I don't know what it is, but it ain't what it was five or even five or six years ago when it was 40, 40 or 40 equals 20. It's 40 equals zero for founders. Absolutes are, are always a little dangerous and there, there's different cultures here. Um, the reality is you're 100%, right? That the say that board members have had over the last couple of years is definitely a lot less than what it was probably five, six, seven years ago. I think it'll sway a little bit more, but there's two things that, that probably, you know, <laughs> really matter in terms of who I say. And that's one, like whether the founder wants to engage it and is actually willing to hear it. Yeah. And if so, like investors will talk and give opinions, but if the founder doesn't want to hear it, it's kind of dead air and there's no real point. It's going to be frustrating tension anyway. So I do think that there is like a need to opt into that process. But two, there's also board vote for better or worse. If a board controls a company, the founder's probably going to have to listen a little bit more than if the board does not control a company. And I think as you go and see a bunch of bridge rounds, down rounds, and all this other stuff that's going to happen in the next couple of years, like the reality is founders are going to have to listen a lot more to their board. And because if the board doesn't agree with it, maybe those founders aren't there. I just don't see the world working that way today anymore. I think they may listen more to the board members the week before they run out of cash, but I, I don't see that awareness of that dynamic of, hey, you, you can ignore your investors for a while, 
but you'll regret it when you need a bridge. I mean, there's so many great tweet storms and 20 VCs on it, but I just don't see that resonating <laughs> with founders this day. I think I think it's either too subtle or it's like I'll deal with I'll deal with that later. I've got a I've got a, too many fires today to deal with. Or of course the next round will come. I don't know what it is, but I think that that dynamic is lost on 95%, not all, but 95% of founders, I think it's lost. Do you think we see a wave of bridge rounds actually? I think there could be this kind of messy middle where for the great companies, they continue raising at great prices. For the new companies, they continue raising at good to great prices. But the messy middle where they're kind of tinkering along in the dark, in the murkiness, they actually just slip through the cracks and they're not AI, they're not hot, they're kind of last gen, and I don't think there's down rounds. There's just bus. I think there's going to be more bus than down rounds and bridges. I think there's not a whole lot of sad uh, for folks to come in uh, unless they're funds that already own a ton of a company. Then there's some salvage value there. The reality is, yeah, there's going to be a lot of bus. And I think that's the reason why, like, if you're a board member, you have fiduciary duty. Like, you need to be ahead of these things, thinking about, okay, like, if there's a bus happening in six months, what are we doing to get ahead of that curve? Like, you need to be responsible to, to shareholders with that. And look, in most cases, the founders are the biggest shareholders of the company. Like, they should be thinking like a shareholder as well, which is part of this is there's not a lot of incentive if you're at a mega fund to go and have those tough conversations because you know it's never going to move the needle. The salvage value is and loss management really doesn't matter at those funds. Yeah, I, I think if you own twenty percent of a company and a hundred million dollar fund and and there's some salvage value there, like that can really help with recycling and a bunch of other things. It all plays to some of the actual venture dynamics that we have today, especially with younger investors who, you know, as I mentioned to you guys, like I feel like in the last five years, I went from being the green hand to the grandpa and every single like board that I, that I was, I remember like being on my first board with Peter Barris and, 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 you know, was managing partner at NEA. Like, you know, my first couple of boards that I was on was with that guy. And I just felt like I was like a complete student in learning mode. You know, now I'm like, ah, oh, I've been on 15 boards. I'm like, you know, a bunch of the folks that I work with, it's the first time that, that they've been there. And, you know, there's less of an incentive and less of a mindset around like how to push back and do those responsible things to cut burns so that you can actually get to a profitable, sustainable business if you're not going to be able to race around which I think you're right. Like if it's not super hot or not going to be a Decacora company, my guess is, you know, most of those top 10 venture firms that are over 2 billion are not going to be knocking on your door. Jason, is there a new age of efficiency? We've spoken about riffs. We've spoken about building more efficient, leaner companies. Is there a new age of efficiency? Or do you think we just go back to high burn ways when liquidity comes back through IPOs or whatever mechanism it comes back through? One of the top things I've, been thinking about in SaaS because we went through this weird, uh, well, we went through a very interesting A-B tester experiment the last five quarters or so. A ton of SaaS startups, startups did layoffs and cuts that we chatted about, uh, but, but they mainly did it so they wouldn't run out of money, right? These were not really strategic decisions, but the public companies all got for their, really for the first time, no matter what he says, huge pressure to get profitable, to get efficient for the first time. This is what happened on Wall Street. And you saw folks in one year all do it. Like Monday.com went from minus 10% operating margins to almost 20% in one year. In one year, companies that are incredibly tough to be profitable and like Toast went from negative to positive in one year. Mongo increased its margins. Every single company that wanted to in one year went from modestly or not profitable to profitable, or at least strong operating margins. We don't have to debate what's gap profitable. And they all did it in a year. The truth is no one had the discipline or the need to do it before. So that the, for the first time in my whole Life in SaaS, we now we have to face the decision. Now that we've proven these B2B companies can be efficient at scale, right? Snowflake's now predicting 45% operating margins going forward. 45% operating margins. So do you get an excuse? Can you burn the massive amounts of money and and will it be tolerated? Or do do we have to do sales and marketing have to make sense? Does CAC have to make sense? I'm wondering, but I think founders should pay attention. I think founders are out of the loop what's happened in the public markets and founders are out of the loop about efficiency. And we founders may need to be radically more efficient for the next five to 10 years if things don't swing back. We don't know, right? Once the public markets get comfortable that, hey, these, these, these companies actually are very efficient, I don't know if they're going to want to fund massive losses afterwards. I don't know if they will. I don't know if they will favor these ones. But I actually think that's why like founders and investors both, we've kind of slipped away from financial acumen as investors where it just became really focused on revenue multiples and how do we chase that multiple you know, as much as we can. 
And it really comes down to business model quality and whether these companies are have a path to profitability and ultimately a path to free cash flow, which like, you know, for all those companies that you can point to on the SaaS side that had really good NDR, really good metrics, you know, uh, behind them, there was a business model that enabled them to get profitable. I can point to a ton of consumer companies, a ton of fintech companies that move the opposite direction that, you know, despite, you know, trying to cut back their growth, you know, went through the floor um, and those companies are largely dead right now. So I think getting back to business model quality, understanding what actually has the potential to drive real shareholder value rather than just chasing revenue. A lot of people are learning a finance lesson for the first time over the last couple of years. And I think like they that are. needs to be reintroduced Introduced into what investing in company creation, company value look like. And it's something that, I don't know, it, it, it certainly is something that we're teaching to the younger folks on our team a lot of like, okay, here's how you create value, not just revenue. I feel sorry for founders though, because I have many in the portfolio who have absolutely learned those lessons. They've cut back on spend, they've cut back on team, they've turned you know into much better, leaner, more efficient businesses, but growth has absolutely slowed. And Jason, we chatted about it before. It's like, they got a pass for growth slowing and that's fine because they're more efficient. Does that continue where it's like, okay, low growth, fine, because you're capital efficient, or do we go back to needing and wanting more growth? The past was a gift for a lot of founders. The path was a gift for founders that had long runways and mediocre growth. They got a year to be left alone. I was in a board meeting where the founder said, I'm, you know, I'm frustrated. I'm only growing 60% this year. And one of the huge VCs said, you've got five years of runway. I don't care. Like I got so many fires in my portfolio last year. I, like I'm, so, I, I, I'm glad you're worried about it because I don't have time to worry about the fact you're only growing 60% this year. Uh, everyone got a pass for a year and it was a gift. And I remember right when COVID hit in, in 2020, Byron Dieter, we did this thing and he said to all the founders, you, you're getting a little bit of a pass for a quarter or two. Now it ended up last, we didn't go back to the office. <laughs> the world changed, but everyone got a pass and, but the pass is over and you can't have, whether the venture outcome is 300 million or a billion or 10 billion, you can't avoid triple, triple, double, double, at least in B2B. You can't avoid it. You can have a, a year gap. You literally can take a year off, but you can go triple, triple, nuns, double, 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 double. Like, but, but if you don't get back on the wagon, uh, it's over, right? It, and this is a cruel thing for founders, but it is over from a venture perspective. And you either got to get back to growth or move to a different phase of your life as a founder. Now, this is the time, like you got to think about it now, this summer, this fall, you either got to get back to growth or uh, it's over. I mean, look at businesses like Datadog that saw so much acceleration as they kind of hit that later phase of the company, both on a product side as well as you know a revenue acceleration perspective. I, I, I do think owning your own destiny is a really, really powerful thing in this market, which if you can be profitable or if you can own your destiny in, in terms of not needing to raise and wanting money versus needing money are two very, very different things. I'd say probably half our portfolio owns its destiny. Those companies are still growing north of 100%. And you know the option of, hey, maybe we'll raise if capital markets is there. If it's not there, we're fine. Pulling that earlier and doing that at early stage is very much the way that you should kind of prep yourself to be an IPOable company. Like, you know, companies that don't need to go public because, you know, they, you know, can weed it out and that they're still growing sustainably and kind of be profitable. That's a better situation than, hey, we need to go public even a shitty market. That's a really, really bad exit scenario if you're a founder or, you know, or a board member. For those companies that are bluntly uh, tailed off on growth, uh, but did cut spend, a lot of the time they also had very aggressive prices that were put together last year. I have a couple in the billion, two billion range, and now they're looking at them like, wow, that's a long way out. First question is, a lot of VCs are sitting on books that are just incredibly highly priced with many companies like this. If you were advising an LP today, on how much they should discount the value of their books. What what would you tell them? It comes down to the company level. Uh, I've definitely heard some secondary offers on some big, big companies that I know that are going to turn some of our peers uh, from 7X funds to 1X funds. That would be really, really scary. Um, at least for us, like we've been very, very forthright. We share a ton of information with our LPs. We have a very small LP base uh, of endowments and foundations that we're, we're, we're tight with. You know, we're not in as much of that situation of having a bunch of two, three billion dollar companies that that were driving the fund that we got to, you know, really freak out about. 
But I think this is going to wash out a ton of venture firms. I think a lot of folks who weren't honest with their LPs, who did a ton of SPVs and these things on the way up, you know, on um, trying to kind of grab every buck that they had and then didn't take liquidity on something that was a three to five billion dollar outcome across like, and it was the one company working in their 50 company portfolio. That's a really, really tough situation now that you're under $600 million of preference and that company is not really worth anything. And your LPs are going to be really pissed with you if you screwed up on an SPV and didn't deliver fund returns to them. So I think that's a tough situation. I've learned something and I have two two thoughts. And I'll tell you what I've done myself, right? At once the market turned, right? First, I basically decided that anything north of 15x ARR had a suspect valuation in the current world. Okay, that's what the top pub. And this, most startups are not going to be the very top. They're most aren't going to be data dog or snowflakes. On the other hand, they're earlier. So I said anything over 15x ARR is suspect. And I did a matrix. Here's the revenue of everything. Here's the last round valuation. And here are the asterisks and daggers for ones that are overvalued based on public comps, right? And if you want as an LP, you could value it this way. Like you could value the portfolio based on this way. It doesn't work if you're too early, right? But it works anywhere north of of five to 10 million in revenue. That's one approach. On the other hand, once you've done that and maybe you take a haircut or two, right? And I took two markdowns, right? From this process, but not 20. Then the question is, okay, you got to look, how healthy is this company? What are the probabilities that you will still have big outcomes? And did, the, did those uh, valuations make sense? And then I asked two of my top LPs, what would you like to see? Would you like to see huge markdowns or something crazy or a massive discount? And their response was no. Their response was, if these valuations are reasonably market correct, they're, they're not done by crazy tiger or soft bank things that don't make sense. And they're in the zone of valuation that makes sense. We don't care. They said, we don't care. You're not that much money to us. You're not, you're not a $10 billion commitment. We want it directionally correct. And you're not a problematic fund for us. We've already tagged you as not pro like it's the problematic ones we want to spend our time on. You're not a problem. And so the meta learning was it wasn't as big an issue or I didn't even get engagement on it. Frankly, I didn't even get the engagement you would think. They're not directionally correct, are they? I mean, let's be honest. I've got Why one. are they not directionally okay. correct? Well, I'm looking at quite a few around like 50, 60 million an ARR, which is great. It's a fantastic yeah. business. And what's and the value price, Last round, 1.7. Last round, 1.4. Right. So what's, what's 50 it? times 15? 750, uh, if it's a good one. So mark that one down by half, Harry. I'll do it for you. We can do, pull out the spreadsheet on the fund together. That one you should just mark down by half. Okay, you don't have so to market should... to zero unless it's yeah, running no, out of money. I'm, just I'm market not, down not, by half. I'm not suggesting market to zero, but market down by half is a lot. Like that's Why? not directionally correct. The market to me. goes up and down too. Why shouldn't our funds go up and down? Fair, but is that directionally correct? No, fifty percent markdown is is like directionally incorrect. It's a severe markdown. Listen, I only have ten years of experience in venture. Okay, but what I do believe is that. The way we've done markups, especially for smaller and other funds, has completely corrupted the industry. Venture wow. would be radically different if there were no markups. It would be radically different. And, I, and I'm confident it would be a better industry. I'm confident it would be a better industry with no markups. Or at best, even though it's expensive and a headache, a conservative Black-Scholes analysis of these assets that would be annoying, but you'd sit on a 1.2x, 1.5x, 2x fund for a decade and so be it. It's not that I don't think mark to market is, is I do think it's telling. I think it's, it, I do think there's something to all of it. Right. But it's corrupted behavior in a way that, that I don't think we anticipate. It's corrupted everything up and down the stack. Right. Why? Why is it corrupted? It, well, yeah. it's corrupted behavior because it's created an incentive to overfund companies to misfund companies. It, it, when times are good, it, it, you hear Rick and others saying, Hey, let's keep companies properly funded. Let's, let's leave room for proper exits. No one gave, gave a heck when they got a markup, when they had a five X fund and could raise another fund. Um, even less discussed is that a lot of LPs big at the bigger LPs, they're compensated based on paper markups too. This is less well understood. They're compensated. This drove crazy. Where, where did all this unicorn explosion come from? People don't understand that the cash had to come from somewhere, right? It didn't all come from what's his name at SoftBank himself. And the fact that some, L, not, not most, but many LPs got compensated themselves on paper markups drove an endless round of markups too. The seed VCs wanted it because the seeds guys looked like genius for the first time. My last fund, the first year I had 140% IRR. That's moronic.
No, but it, but it wasn't. It can't last. I'm not that good. You can't last. Can't last for 14 years. That's year one was the high, our high point of that fund. Year one was uh, it should be the other way around. Like years eight or nine should be the high point. Year one was the IR high point, right? And so of course you get addicted to it, right? You want that, and it and it and it means raising too many rounds, too many rounds at too high valuation. Maybe we took a pause on it briefly, but that corruption is going to come back. Every CVC wants a four X or higher fund. And a couple of unicorns to sustain their business. Everyone wants it. Everyone says they don't. I think is lying. But I think the LPs are are wiser to that now, Jason. I don't know. Yeah, but like, they don't want nothing. But they don't want a fly, a one X fund forever or a none X fund. They sure don't want the opposite. Like they say that, Rick. And I don't mean they say that. But they don't want. I don't think they want the opposite. I don't think they want. Oh well, listen. All of them are going to be sub uh, nine figure exits, or all of them are dogs, or you know, SoftBank or whoever. And Dreesen won't invest in any. They don't want that either. I think they want ten bagger funds, and they want trust. And I think the reality is, like, if they could be an emergence fund or a USV fund that has a twenty bagger, you know, the returns of those funds are amazing. And I'm very. Very confident that those didn't look like 140% IRR funds right out of the gate. Like they took time to compound. But I think those funds have developed tremendous amount of trust with their LP bases. Say, okay, we're going to let the game play out. Now, if you're an emerging manager, like I certainly felt pressure on this on equal one of like, okay, I want to show our LPs that, and I want to show the market, you know, that we're, you know, we have a great portfolio. So, you know, let's go and get all these markups. And, and that certainly helped us. You know, that helped our reputation market, helped our reputation with LPs. But at least at our last, AGM, like it was very, very frank discussion around, okay, like, do you guys trust us? Like, we may do less frequent fundraises. We may actually buy up more and be more aggressive with our opportunity fund to go out there. At least for us, our LPs were immensely supportive uh, of that approach, unless they're not telling you, <laughs> but that's, that's what they did. And I think, you know, the best LPs do think that they're saying, hey, like, you don't know what your portfolio is worth here. Like, what's your process that you have? Do we believe in that process? Do we believe in your team? Do we believe in your approach? And we're going to see that play out and hopefully just be as transparent and, and demonstrate trust with us that we're going to let that game play out over the course of these funds. But I think all the emerging managers that have come to the game over the last couple of years, like we were all fighting for so much capital with each other. Like a lot of those doors are now closed. And I think it's LPs figuring out, all right, like how much trust do I have with that? These people are not bullshitting me on these numbers. How much trust do I have that like, these are actually high quality companies. And I'm hopeful that that actually gets us all a little bit off the hamster wheel. Cause at least for me, I'd rather spend time like working and building the companies than raising rounds every six months. You know, there are times over the last couple of years that I felt like an investment banker. And that's like the last thing that I want to be. Do you think LPs trust their managers? Because all the LPs say to me, hey, you know, book values are so varying. I've got one manager who holds it at 3 billion, one manager who holds it at 1 billion. I don't know where to put my books. I don't know who to believe. That all seems to suggest to me a complete lack of trust. I think they trust some and they don't trust others. Like, you know, like I'd rather sandbag and surprise to the upside than be in a position where I've overpromised and underdelivered. Again, maybe that's the middle class, like, you know, middle child, you know, you know, in me, but I think, you know, under promising and over delivering is a great way to, uh, you know, restore a lot of trust with LPs. And like, we've generally turned down like capital into our fund and kept our fund sizes reasonable. That way, like we could have a smaller LP base that we felt was more trusting. We try to be super transparent with our LPs about what's going on. Uh, I'm sure there'll still be lumps that we take in our portfolio that we don't see, and that's bound to happen. But I do think that there's a lot of distrust and especially like very big portfolios or when someone sees a 100x markup and no revenue behind it. Some of these companies that have zero revenue, but a several billion dollar valuation, like that's a very, very tough situation to justify that this is going to be, especially in the really, really hot stuff, like you know, everything in AI. You should probably be taking some discounting on those rounds. Most funds, I mean, when you're big, it's different, but most funds that aren't huge have a few core anchors, right? They really do. And typically those relationships are trust-driven, right? They, they are trust-driven. That's why they're anchors. The rest, it is transactional and LP should be suspect. There's, there's suspect GP behavior. There's suspect CEO behavior. I think the suspect GP behavior is more subtle. It's overstating things. It's exaggerating your role with companies. It's draw, connecting dots that don't quite exist uh, in terms of ownership and stake and time. 2020, 21 was a weird world. It's hard for all but the best funds to raise LP capital. It has swung back to being hard as it historically was, right? It traditionally took two years to raise a fund, not, not an email 
And so that naturally leads to everyone trying to be uh, uh, tr trying to be as aggressive with the facts as they can be. And LP seeing them as a product. It's it's a complicated it's a complicated relationship. It's a complicated relationship. You know, I just met with a great LP that I have who has been a bit of a mentor to me, uh, at least a little bit. He was thinking about dropping a top tier fund because managers had changed and they hadn't been properly communicated and he wasn't sure what would happen with the next generation of the fund, right? There's just lots of dynamics and it's very hard to be an LP. It's an easy job in that it's very, very slow, but it's very hard to get good at it, right? It's very, it's, 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 it's another order of magnitude slower feedback loop than venture, which is, which is pretty slow. <laughs> I mean, you, you do hit on something that's really important on, on this use is that there's just been like such a focus on salesmanship across the entire venture ecosystem. It's like so much pitching at YC yeah, Demo Day. So it's GPs like pitching as much as they can. Let's just cut through the sales for a second and actually just like have substance, which I think relationships be able to form more naturally. Like one of my mentors is an LP and just that's been a very long term relationship that I think that they've been able to see us develop. A lot of the founders that we work with, you know, I haven't taken a pitch in eight years because I think pitching is bullshit because I think it's all about sales salesmanship and rather than actually like me understanding your understanding of a company. And I think if we all did 10% less sales and actually 10% more substance, everyone would be a lot better off. Jason, do you agree with that in terms of the pitch? Because I know you like an email that's like very structured, has everything, has a deck, has a lot of substance. I think I feel I like Rick, you Rick like was maybe was Rick, were you talking about LPs or were you talking about founders? I'm talking about up and down the entire, like when we went out for fun one, our pitch was terrible. Like I, I, I won't say which fund of fun, but one of my friends showed me the notes in their CRM from, and they're like, this pitch sucks. Like doesn't make sense. Da, 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 da. And I was like the LPs that we ended up resonating with, they took time to understand us. They realized that we sucked at pitching and really got me you know, on board with the story and a process. Honestly, that's the way that I resonate. Like those are the types of founders that I like. I don't like a pitch. I just want to understand them and see how they work. You know, but I, I do see. think that this overselling across like founders selling GPs, GP signing LPs, everything feeling like it's a demo day. I think it kind of takes us away from what we're supposed to be doing on the field and actually makes us just obsessed with you know, pitching all the time. I see your point. Yeah, I actually do. Harry's right. I do really like it when the founder is good at pitching. Um, I like it when the first email is so good that you want to invest by the bottom of the email. I like it when I'm already want to invest before the Zoom starts. I want to invest when, before the minute I meet them. And, it, and you miss stuff. You would have missed Rick's first fund. You would have missed these other founders, right? Um, and I was on, you know, I did this, I did this catch up with the Monday.com founders the other day and they showed me the, e the pitch email they sent me. It was the worst ever when they were starting. It had a different name. It was terrible. It's like, we're thinking about doing it in something in productivity. Would you like to talk? Okay. And it was, and these are the best guys in the world. And so I didn't take the meeting. Not that I lost. I didn't even take the meeting for forget about passing or missing it. So you'll miss the Mondays by this approach, but you gain a ton of efficiency because in B2B, you got to sell, man. No one needs another SaaS product. We already have 11 payroll companies and 88 CRMs and 96 market. We don't need one. So if you can't force your way into a market and selling stock is sales, it's a weird niche sales, but you better make good as a founder. So I like the ones, not that are used car salesmen, but I like the one that are new car salesmen. Like they convinced me there's a model three that came out of nowhere and I got to buy it. And I'm, I'm all in, like I'm all in when I see that. I'm just like, you know what, as a founder, you, you have to pitch and you have to be fucking good at pitching because you have to sell customers, you have to sell investors, and you have to sell employees. And actually, if you can't crisply articulate it, it to, to all three, you're in trouble. If you can't get the cash in the door, you're in trouble. You can't get the customers in the door, you're in trouble. You can't get the engineers or employees in the door, you're in trouble. So if you can't pitch well, succinctly, and get people on board with your vision, and they need time and they need patience, I think your likelihood of winning is dramatically reduced. So I would say like when numbers do your talking for you, that pitch is so much easier, which uh, uh, the two biggest drivers in our fund, the the pitch at CCH for both those companies was extremely problematic. And those companies have now gone on and raised a boatload of money from like top, 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 top tier VCs. We were able to work with them to improve their pitch and know how to do a fundraising process. And so both, both times, first time founders. But I do think that Pitching is very much an art form that Silicon Valley like has embraced. Like it's very much in this Don Val uh, Don Valentine archetype. And yeah, there's people that all they do is practice pitching and they forget how to run a business. And I do think 
salesmanship is one thing, but like if you're selling to the insurance industry or selling to, you know, a uh, rig hand or, you know, or a truck driver, that's very, very different than selling to, you know, a, a, a venture capitalist. And I do think, Jason, what you do, like very locked into a certain type of sales process around selling to CIOs, CIOs, CIOs CTOs, enterprises, like you understand that 10 times better than I will ever if I spend the next 20 years of my life focused on it. But I do find at least in what we do where the customer bases are very different, we just haven't seen a lot of correlation between the folks who are like really great at raising money at the seed stage and the folks who are really great at building a business. And the people who are really great at building a business, they get pretty good at pitching over time too. So. Yeah, but I don't think the pitch always has to be positive. Like a question that I like to ask is like, what are the top three reasons why I shouldn't invest? And if you can clearly articulate the three biggest weaknesses and why they are challenges, but then maybe articulate a plan of how you plan to mitigate them, that shows incredible self-awareness. It shows incredible knowledge of ecosystem, of your own flaws. That's not like pitching in the salesmanship we're great, but it teaches me a lot about how you think strategically as a leader, about positioning, about your own flaws, about resource allocation. So I think we can like connote success and salesmanship with pitching, which is like you can pitch and still present challenges. I love it when a founder's like, oh my God, there's so many things on fire. We've run out of SDRs. We're spending too much on Facebook, but there's this crux of this brilliance that's working. I still think that's incredibly exciting. So I think there's more to it than like positive pitching. It, it depends how much gamification is happening, right? So, you know, if someone knows that you're going to ask that question, someone's going to prepare for that question. It's like, you know, the, the, the way that people are preparing for the GMAT, like, is it really a test of intelligence when you know uh, if you you know spend enough tra time training to answer a certain type, like, are you going to get good at it? Like, the answer is yes. So uh, at least my approach, which is different from other members of our team, this is just me, is the reality is like, I review your deck. I actually know the four or five key questions to get me into conviction. And I come in there and like, I spring on the founder, hey, we're not going to do a pitch. I want to talk about these four or five things. Like, here's what now I need to get to conviction. Like, let's go. If they really understand their business, they're going to be able to talk, talk, talk through this. If they don't, they are going to completely like, it's a bad meeting very, very early. If you're a seed investor, um, it is absolutely true that at some point as a founder, you will get good at pitching in VCs, uh, investors. It may be when you're a public company because you still are going to be pitching investors as a public company all the time too. You're going to be spending one month out of three pitching investors are just different. Or you might get good at it when the numbers are perfect at the late stage, or some folks get really good at it before demo day, right? If they're well-trained. I do think Rick's got a good point that, that, you know, the Monday example is just so fun. You're not, people aren't necessarily born great fundraisers, right? Or, or even great sellers, right? Most founders are born great builders. Like we build products. And the question is, do you want to put in the energy to cut them the slack? Because what I do takes no energy, right? To judge somebody by their email. It does cut out education bias and a bunch of other country bias, but it doesn't cut out, you know, sell your vision well bias, right? If his two best investments are ones that had terrible pitches and no traction, you got to put in the time. Like you got to really meet a thousand companies a year. And I have, I only actually, I'll, I'll read 50 emails a week, but I only want to do one pitch a week. I only, if I can, that's my dream. And I find when I do two, three or four, the other three aren't worth it. And then I got to follow up with the email and I got to explain why, and they don't listen. And it's like 11 emails and I never should have done the third or fourth meeting because it was on the bubble, right? So you got to do 50 to do this strategy. It's respect. It's respect. Jason, you want to hear something absolutely insane? Yeah. I take like on average, one new founder meeting a week. Okay, well, you uh, boil it down for better so, or worse, right? Well, yeah. So, so at least for us, like we are so meticulously thesis driven that I really try to down select. And uh, there's this bar that we have that is like, does this deal have the potential to change your life? If not, pass. Like, and yeah. like, how do you know that? Because like bluntly, you know, your Monday.coms, your pipe drives, your sa like sales loft. If you saw the pre-seed or seed, like no offense, Jason, I don't think it would have like, oh, this could change my family's life with the grand vision of sales loft. I, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's not that obvious. So so here's my mental model around it, and it's probably a broken one, but it's the only one I got. One, does this have the chance to be such a F you big outcome that like it's going to completely like 
return our fund five, 10 times that like you believe in your heart of hearts that it's an Uber size outcome with Decacorp potential that you see that so early that you cannot miss it. And that's a, a meeting that I need to take too. You know, we have a process that we call hunting. Like we have our top 10, 15 ideas on our big board that like I am laser focused on finding companies related to those and screening for the quality of those companies and our team screening for the quality of those. So if it's an idea that I feel like I need to flip the card, like, you know, Rogers talked about this for Trade Desk. He was like, I needed to flip the card on that company because it was a thesis that I had thought about so much. And I just like couldn't live with myself if I didn't flip that card for me like flipping that card changes my life or third is it one of these founders that you believe that has the chance to be like truly once in a generation that is that exceptional you know in a very objective way not like a good founder but someone who has the chance to be absolutely that insanely good and at least for me like yeah we miss a ton of great companies, a ton of great companies. But you do find screening that down and really focusing on like, how can I win the best companies that are the best fit for our approach? We have a company working in our office right now. The founder sold his last company for over a billion dollars. I spent six months courting this founder. It's in a thesis that we freaking love. And now he's building, you know, we are double digit owners of that business. And I'd rather spend my time working on that than like, taking 25 pitches and like, yeah, just like hearing the same thing over and over because that's, that's how I have fun, but it's definitely not the same for everyone. And I think there's multiple different ways to do this. Just trying to do it a little bit different than everybody else, I guess. I, I, I just, I did the memo, which was a show where we interviewed uh, lead ambassadors of amazing breakout companies. And we did, you know, lead ambassador for Snap, the lead ambassador for Twilio, the lead ambassador for Instacart, uh, for 10. And the single commonality of that investing thesis was we all underestimated the size of the outcome. Yeah, we thought Snap could yep. be like a 300 million exit to Facebook. Twilio, like, I mean, Byron was like, oh, we kind of had no idea. I mean, honestly, it could have been something that Salesforce or Oracle buy, but they were consistently like, we thought it could be interesting and picked up for a decent amount, but the size and enormity of the exit was deeply underestimated. And so I don't know, dude, I, and I mean this nicely, I just really struggle with that first one of like, oh, I can tell the FU size because I think you'll miss the biggest. You know, we, something we forgot about, Harry, when I started investing, I was taught this, this very simple heuristic or hubric, and then we all forgot about it. When I was taught, when I was investing, when exits were all small in SaaS, when I started 2013, 2014, there were no HubSpot IPO'd at 800 million. Like there weren't these big outcomes. So I was taught this simple thing, distilled it all. And it sounds so tactical, but are you confident the next round will be 3X this valuation? If you're confident, do it. It solves for a lot of issues if you slow it down and think about it, right? Do you think it might be worth more? Well, every VC that doesn't have deal flow thinks it's going to be worth more. It doesn't have good deals. But are you truly, forget about what, whether sales off is going to be worth two and a half billion in cash, which didn't know, or pipe drive a billion and a half or a goalie, whatever. Didn't, didn't know to the, to the Byron point. But I was confident for a variety of reasons they would be worth 3x the price. And, and this all got blown up with crazy valuations, but it does force you to break it into one atomic unit, right? Which is, is this company doing enough good things, right? With enough good founder and enough things so that you're going to have not a, even a 2X, a 3X outcome. That was what I used in the beginning of investing. And now thinking about it live, I regret that I moved away from it because it it, it actually forced the, a, a pretty decent way of thinking. Yeah, I'm 100%. Like, I don't know what's going to happen with Pipe Drive or Al Goli or TalkDesk or sells off. But shoot, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to the next round, like pretty good founders. Like, I don't know about this twin this talk API, I mean, I wasn't there, but 3X, yeah, like, yeah, you know, and if every investment's 3X, as dumb as it sounds, you'll have a 3X fund, right? That's pretty I, good. I, I totally agree. And then I think that the other thing I think is like, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, different people, different approaches. And then a lot in Europe, people say, well, it doesn't matter, you know, you don't have to get them all. Actually, you do because there are not many at all. When you look at the companies over 10 billion in Europe, as an example, you know, you've got Spotify. You've got Ad Yen, um, you know, Revolut is valued over 10 billion. But the idea of like, oh, you don't have to see them all. Even in the US, like there's very, very, very few that are over $10 billion. You kind of do need to have coverage play now because the enormity of exit is much more realistic. And I think about that a lot more now. How do you guys think about that? There are plenty of 10X funds that haven't ever been in a Decacorn. 
And like, I think Roger probably has a couple, Mucker has a couple, you know, um, Tim Connors has some monster funds that like, you know, certainly some big dri- drivers in there. And then you look at funds like Emergence and USV that have had, you know, massive, massive funds. And certainly they have some DACA cords in there. So I think you're right that that first one of this will change my life. It is really, really, really hard to figure out what is going to be a massive company at the seed stage that, you know, plenty of people have haircut things and express the upside. At least for us, we look for the ideas that we think are going to be really transformative industry. And I am not going to guess what's, what's going to happen to long-term outcome that hopefully they have flight path to a $10 billion company. Like there's definitely TAM in all these industries to be able to do that. But companies can screw up a thousand times you now or along that way that cuts that path short. So I think like the the scary thing about venture is when you really cut yourself off that like if you're a European seed stage VC and the only way you can win is if you have Spotify, that is a really, really tough position to, to be in. If that's the only way you can three to five extra fund, you know, chances are is that you're not going to succeed and then you're going to lose to guys like you. I mean, you got a way better chance to get in that than 99% of the other, you know, VCs that are out there. But, you know, our job is to go and find ways to make money. In, and I think there's plenty of private equity funds, growth equity funds, you know, that have found ways to deliver 40, 50% IRRs to their LPs without being inside those. It's just like when you get on such a big fund cycle that you're required to do that. And look, we, we have a unicorn in our portfolio. We got a bunch of companies that look like they'll, 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 they'll get there. Yeah, I'm hopeful one of those turns into a Decacorn. But I think when we force a company that like rightfully is not going to be a Decacorn company down that irrational path, it's like flushing money down the toilet that, that it's like, okay, maybe we can actually get this to a $500 billion company. Let's actually figure out once we're in there, like, is the founder going to scale? Is this going to have the potential to do that? Like, oh, wait, I own 15% of this thing. And if we could sell this thing for a couple hundred million dollars, because we know it's not going to be a deck of corn. Yeah. There's a couple companies in our portfolio. Then I'm like this, if this, if we have a deck of corn in our portfolio, it's going to be one of these three or four. Uh, and we know the ones that are not going to be there and, you know, trying to make sure that we can make as much money from them as we can. Okay, uh, Jason, do you have anything to add before we do a quick fire? Thinking through it, I think there's two ways to build a, a unicorn plus. You can stair step it or you can you can swing for the fences from the start. And the swing from the fences, you can you can have the perfect idea and and thesis and make sure it's a large space and make sure that there's a, a fifty billion dollar TAM accessible. Or you can stair step and you say, look, am I a hundred percent sure or ninety percent sure there's gonna be a three X to the next round? And just thinking on it, I think I've done better stair stepping personally. I've done better stair stepping than whiteboarding. I've done better. Now, stair stepping does force you to be more valuation sensitive, which is maybe why a lot of us abandoned it. Like it's hard to stair step from 100 to 300. It's much easier to stair step from 15 to 45 or 10 to 30. And when we all lost discipline in the peak, maybe we all stopped stair stepping and looked for markups. The Twilio example, or even, um, you know, even Shopify, Bessemer exited Shopify. They didn't know, right? You got to stair step some of these, some of these ones. And uh, maybe that's the back to basics is founders should founders don't do this anymore. Harry and Rick, I don't think if I want to be grouchy about something, they don't raise around and say, am I 100 percent sure I'm going to three exit because they shouldn't take the money like slow it down if you're. And I literally had a founder the other day who had an offer at 450 and just turned it all down for the first time in the history of this company. And I asked him why he's like the the three X math. It's not worth it. It ain't, it ain't worth it. So slow it. Stair step as founders. Make sure you can stare your life. Your, your VCs may pressure you on this, but if you triple their money, everything works out for everyone in the cap table, right? It may not make the fund. It may not, but if everyone three X's, it's enough. And so stair step your life. And I do think you can build unicorns and large funds stair stepping. And that's what I'm going to get back to, right? A stair, stair stepping deals, just stair stepping them, right? 20 million post fine, but I got to know it's going to be 60. <laughs> How do you feel about that in this market, though, where like seed seals are absurdly expensive and A's have definitely depressed in value that like, I mean, it, 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 I would almost wonder whether you're seeing some adverse selection in there. You like, always can say yeah. that a lot of these investment strategies, everyone will say there's adverse selection. When I started investing in European founders, some folks I invested in said, don't even tell the LPs that you're doing that because it shows you don't you can't get any Americans to invest in. Well, you know, I wouldn't have done Algole or Front or Pipe Drive or Gorgeous or others if I was prejudiced against Europeans. Right. I wouldn't have even met Harry because I would have been too ready, I guess. And so, yeah, there's a lot of the, but this adverse selection thing. I think you can take it too far because you want to find the undiscovered gems. 
The adverse selection ignores the undiscovered gems. The adverse selection focuses on the eight guys from Stripe, uh, the eight white men from Stripe that have the perfect Stripe 2.0. That's what positive selection gets you. And uh, works for big funds, right? I Adverse selection. Scrolling from like Decacorn hunting to like, okay, like, you know, maybe Jason is in the back to the basics, like, you know, camp now, you know, now. But I think Harry's got the point from the memo, which is you can stair step your way to an epic outcome. That's what we lost track of. You can stare. It's not mitigating risk. It's just stair stepping the way and not and and keeping life simple, right? Just making sure genuine. You're con- as an investor and as a founder, you're just ultra confident you can triple that value, um, or you raise because you have no choice. That's always okay. Like if your back's against the wall, then just get the deal done. But you know, keeping life simple is actually really hard. It like it requires a lot of work, a lot of discipline, keeping the options open because you're alive long enough for like things to magically happen. And, and that's the reality of like, okay, there's a lot of hard work that goes in at these early stages that all of a sudden doors open and, and that's when you got to take your shot, which I think as an early stage VC, it's all right, how can you get enough really high quality shots on net on the field? Get those companies to product market fit, get them to early stages of scale, do all those hard things. And then at that point, hopefully you own a ton of, you know, some companies that actually have the chance to, you know, ascend to greatness. But you got to also be really draconian with the portfolio and say, okay, like, can I get a couple turns of my fun on some of these other ones, you know, that are going to ascend to a te- deca core type back home, but you've kept it alive and got enough ownership and done the hard things, you know, through that time. And I think that really gets thrown to the wayside when, you know, you're looking for a deck of corn between seed and series A that the side, you know, the stair stepping, I think is better for founders and it's better for, for investors. It just gets really, really hard when people don't have patience in the ecosystem. We're like, wait, if I didn't get my next round done by Sequoia, this isn't going to be the one. And, Turns out that Sequoia didn't invest in every single Decacor company at this year. Say sometimes it takes a little bit later. Harry, how many? How many? I know. You, I know we're almost done. But how many meetings do you do a week with new founders? How many do you think? How, or how? And how many get close to a meeting? How many do you do a week? I do three new founder meetings a week. Um, three. Team Kieran, my partner, does thirty-five. Okay. So he helps so, with the funnel. He helps with funnel. He management, really right? helps me with leverage. And then I do two to four, generally sits at three. I think honestly, for me, that allows me to be super researched before I go in. No, I hate yep. going in where you don't know anything. You haven't seen the deck and you're kind of going, what's going on? I want to know what I'm doing. I want to know the story. I want to be ready to go with questions. Honestly, I can't do that with more than three and provide a great customer experience. And so I like to cap it there and provide a good experience to viewer. This is the kind of stuff that people don't realize. I mean, you can't do 50 meetings a week, no matter what they say on the internet. You, you can't, you can, you can show up with no work. You can show up with a cup of coffee. You can't really do the work for 50 founders a week, right? You can't really do 2,000 meetings a year. Oh, right? That's what board meetings became. You know, who, yeah. who got to see the 20 page board deck when you're on 16 yeah. boards? No one. So when you meet three, so you've got three, um, what in your mind in those three, what are the odds you're going to do each deal? Like, what do you think? Are you already favorably disposed? Are you in the middle? Like, where, 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 how are you thinking about these three? Like, where's the next stage of your funnel? Honestly, I don't like to preempt like how I'm going to do because then I think it positively sways it. I think the thing that I really try and resist is like this came from X person, so I'm 90% inclined. Like, yeah, I really try and go in with a fresh mind. I know that sounds kind of bullshit, but like I really try not to be swayed and to go in without a I'm positively or negatively inclined because I think the hardest thing as an investor is mental plasticity between deals. I've lost money in healthcare before. Doesn't mean all healthcare deals are crap. I've made yeah. money in enterprise before. Doesn't mean all enterprise is good. And so I really try and not be swayed positively or negatively. And I think that's very hard to do. Over the time you've been investing, you get you've gotten for a variety of reasons, you've gotten great referrals from top tier funds over the years. Great referrals. Now that you've refined your model, how do you think about those? Is that always a winner model? Um, Because you just I think you just said something about having positive. You don't want to be too positive going into a meeting. Right. So when a successful partner at a good fund refers it. What it, how have you learned the nuance of that over your years of your of, Let, of investing? Let's just call it state of state. Of Partners at yeah. top funds do not refer shit anymore. Let's just call so it. So that's changed. That world's changed, right? Yeah, that world's totally changed. So I, I got okay. advised uh, that great funds are built in three stages. Stage one is your collaborative. You write 100k checks and you are just yeah. Everyone wants you in. 
yeah, part two is where you do flex your muscles a bit more. You write slightly larger checks, but on the whole, you're still collaborative. And then three yeah. is when you are just competitive. Truth is, <laughs> and it's the hard truth and it's the ugly truth, we are just competitive now. We have to yeah. build a better product that competes with these firms, but we're competitive. And I'm not afraid to say it because I'm not going to lose any deal flow because they don't send it. You know who sends it? <laughs> who sends it is the amazing operators that I know. It's the amazing friends that I have through doing this shows who are heads of product heads of growth heads of sales but yeah. it's not the vcs if you think the gps at sequoia come and say harry here's a deal for you that because we like your british accent oh yeah, i would take half that. the round yeah they might they, <laughs> occasionally i might get harry your distribution's valuable here's 25k yeah well, <laughs> it doesn't pay that it doesn't pay the rent you know, as Chris, uh, you know, says, you would know, you do two fifty for one of those deals, or is it not even worth it? It's not worth it. I can't. No, it's not. Make I mean, it. I know the answer, I'm, but I'm curious what what you would say, right? No, it's not because worth then it, right? that's how you get a bad MPS. Then I can't you deliver do get a, a bad good MPS from it. They, you get a bad MPS from small checks. Founders don't. Yeah. I write this. I wrote three of these emails today. I don't do small checks, and uh, pe people don't get it. But you do get bad. It's bad, right? It, you get a bad MPS for it, right? Yeah, you're you, expected you, to do more than the person writing the twenty million dollar check for the twenty thousand dollar check. A hundred percent, and you just yeah. cannot scale that. And so for me, I, I'm very clear <laughs> with, hey, I'm sorry, this is out of my range, but I super appreciate it. But but no, and so it's a very clear transition. I, mean, I, I think that's insane. Just when they you have it and like i love it at least for me like we didn't we never had that collaborative phase like you know i didn't come up with you know the the same type of networks as the two of you so like the deals that i grew up on were always outsider deals and it was always like if i didn't lead that round it wasn't getting done with that like our mvp from day one with equal was like we're gonna lead every single company that we did virtually every single company that we did in fund one we led we took the board seed for better or worse that we were like competitive with folks on day one and it was more like sending deals to other folks but i do find that like there is this really unspoken you know, competitive dynamic that like, you know, especially at seed, everyone tries to be immensely collaborative and then it's, all right, you get bigger. Like you're trying to own 15%. You know, the reality is I can hang out with you at the bar. Like we, our kids can, you know, and go to school together. We can do all these wonderful things, but like, I got to go make money for LPs and I want to go win that deal. So yeah, I do think that, uh, especially as venture funds have gotten bigger, like that doesn't get spoken about enough and it does become how can i win this deal how can i have that best meeting with the founder to go convince them to take me over you know the next person and at least like the good graces of sequoia had i don't think i've ever received a deal, a deal referral from sequoia in my life you know um hopefully someday i will but now i need to you know actually wonder whether there's that adverse selection in that not based on what you're saying harry so yeah, when Doug Leone calls you and says, hey, please come and do this deal with me. I've saved you an extra large allocation. I would have a second thought. <laughs> you know, I mean, if Doug Leone ever called me, I'd probably just like fall over and die right then. But, you know, uh, 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 yeah, uh, he, he's, he's one of the goats. So. He's, he's come to tell you that you, you can't predict big markets and you need to 3x step it then, my friend. That's yeah. what he's come to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I think, so many people give advice on how to win in venture. And I feel so many people try to follow the Sequoia playbook when they are not Sequoia. The competitive advantages that Sequoia has to run and execute that playbook make them extremely, extremely good. I, I've always, you know, I was talking to one of our LPs, major endowment. I was like, look, like I get that that works for Sequoia, but like the reality is I'm not Sequoia. Like we are a very different strategy. We're doing something very, very different. And like, I'm going to try to be the best version of Rick Zula. I'm going to be try to be the best version of Equal Ventures. I think this process works. Do you believe in this process? And, you know, we'll see how it all bear, bears out. You know, give me another 10, 15 years and I'll either be really poor or really happy. Right, Japs. I want to do a quick fire round with you. So I pelt questions at you and you answer them in a short supply. Okay. Sound good? Okay. So what is the most important trend in venture the world or the ecosystem is not paying attention to rick i think the reality is then broken incentives that venture firms have of all these zombie vcs that are series a series b series c at multi-stage funds a lot of those venture investors may not be there three to five years from now if you are building a company if you're trying to construct your board knowing who will and will not be there uh as your company is going through scaling going public 
that is a major risk that no one's talking about and something that we are really concerned about as we look at downstream funding for companies uh, and figure out, okay, how can we partner with folks like Jason who we know for better or worse, like Jason's going to be running his fund for, you know, here at the end of time because his name's on the door. Jason, what's the most common reason companies don't scale from seed to A? You mentioned the three act step up. What's the reason that doesn't happen? I think here's what I think the most common reason is they have good but not great growth. This is the risk for seed investors, especially late seed investors. And I didn't used to want to think this was true. When I started investing, I did a whiteboard and I looked at, I said, okay, when I was at 10 million ARR, I was growing hundred percent. So I only want to invest in companies growing at least 120. And I boiled that down to at least 8% a month growth at sort of the mid seed stage. And I kept it as a rule, right? And I've bent that rule a little bit and people will tell you otherwise. And they'll tell you about folks that got lost in the jungle, but that's where I don't see it happen is you do good. Like you're building a real company and it's growing, but it goes from one to two in a year or it goes from two to th- to 3.1 in a year. And the founders don't get it, but that's where you fall. It's, it's, it's tough, but that's where you fall off the track. And you can still have, make good money as a founder, but you're off the venture track without realizing it. Good to, the line between good and great is subtle, but it's painful, but it's so real. It's just so real. Right. What's the biggest investing mistake that you've made and how did it change your mindset? Honestly, I'm incredibly thesis driven and I've missed a lot of amazing companies because of that. I uh, told the story that around investing in the guys from Vettery and then like they started a public company in our office and we did invest. Um, you know, uh, that company is called Archer Aviation. And like that's that's incredibly depressing. I- I'm very, very happy for those folks. But I do think it's made me like very much think more about that third, you know, aspect of how folks can change your life and being more open for founders that aren't in your thesis, that you have a real deep connection with that. Like I should just written those guys a check you know like that that was insane of me so all right we're gonna do a bet and we're gonna finish on the bet i like a good bet as we've learned but the bet is how much vc spending goes into ai in 2024 versus 2023 we've got three options is it 2x is it 1x or is it down where are we placing our chips i'm voting 2x I think we've, everyone's a thematic investor and I think this has just started and I think, or big checks need somewhere to go. Big money needs somewhere to go. Big money is still out there and it can't go into SaaS companies at 500K and ARR. It's going to go into where massive spend is and NVIDIA is not going down and OpenAI is not going bankrupt. And these may be terrible bets in my opinion, but uh, I think Rick, you, you might've DM'd on this before. Every top SaaS investor I know is now an AI investor, and I'm not sure they're ready to, to, to go back to SaaS. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Are we talking about dollars deployed or number of deals done? I'm talking about dollars. I'm convinced, right or wrong, it's going to double next year, even if it makes no actual sense. It's going to It's too big. It's too big I, I a mean, theme. Will, it's too big a theme. It, it's a compound. I will say, like, Jason's argument does make a lot of sense. And, you know, there that I do think it's for, this is one of those things for better or for worse. Hopefully we can agree it's for worse that that actually may be the case because I do think it is like if we're talking about high quality deals where money should be put, I don't think it should be in AI next year. I'm already hearing like a lot of fatigue from folks on like, okay, like, yeah, we we drove that. But there are going to be a lot of these late stage companies that like some of them are real open AI. Open AI could take like another $2 billion, $3 billion check and then be like, okay, that's actually like all of what went into climate tech actually just went into open AI, one company. I'm going to go with Jason on 2X. I, I, but I think there's going to be a consolidation of capital. I think it's going to go to open AI, Anthropic, some of the largest runway, uh, some of the largest players. So I don't think it's going to be as spread out as it has been, but I 100% think the dollar deployment will increase 2X. Fantastic. What's the bet, boys? Well, I mean, now I'm kind of sitting in Jason's camp. He, he well, sold are me. we all on the same side? We can't make the bet. You need someone to take the other side of the bet. Oh, Rick, Rick, Rick made his bet. He's down. Oh, he's down? <laughs> oh, well, then You're I'll down. take that. I'll take the bet. What's the, you, Rick, you call the dollar about. I'm, uh, I'm in. You know, like, uh, you know, if we want to do number of uh, companies, uh, you know, we can do it. But, you know, <laughs> like, uh, I, I'm in loss mitigation mode right now. Like, you know, like, uh, I try, try trying to pull uh, the aqua hair on my hat, you know, uh, you know, out of here on this one. Because I, I think you're right. Like, these platforms, 
they're going to raise a shitload of money. So, you know, it just is what it is. So, you know, uh, ne never have it said that I didn't admit when I'm wrong. So, you know. That is, that is amazing. Listen, guys, I so appreciate this. I so appreciate you uh, joining me for this session. I've loved chatting. This has been fantastic. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Harry. Talk to you soon.